The following program is a presentation of Grace Communion International and Grace Communion Seminary and is made possible by generous donations from viewers like you. On this episode of You're Included, theologian Dr. Robin Perry discusses God's purpose for salvation and how it is already achieved for everyone. Our host is Dr. J. Michael Fazell. Does the Bible give place to the possibility that God will ultimately be successful in drawing absolutely everybody to faith in Christ? I think most Christians would answer that unequivocally, no. <laughs> um, and I'm a little unusual in that regard. Uh, I do think that the Bible does uh, provide good grounds for hope. Uh, that indeed you know, God will achieve his purpose of saving all people. And I know I'm a little bit out on a limb here, although it is a Christian tradition with a noble heritage, um, even though it's been a minority sport through the years, and I think it's a Christian tradition rooted in both scripture and in the gospel itself. And um, I'm not suggesting it's something that, you know, if you're an orthodox Christian, you have to believe this. I mean, that, I, I would never dare be so... <laughs> <laughs> so uh, bold or arrogant to suggest that. But I do think that, it's, that the idea that God will save all people through Christ is neither heretical, uh, nor dodgy, nor unbiblical. What, what we want to say, I mean, in a sense, the idea it grows out of a deep Christian instinct grounded in fundamental orthodox Christian beliefs. We believe that God created all things and that God created all things good and that God purposes good things for his creation. Uh, we believe that although that, that Christ becomes incarnate as representative man, not just for some people, but for humanity. He stands before God as high priest, as a human in our place, he, as the God-man. This comes out brilliantly in the work of T.F. Torrance. Most Christians, not all, most Christians believe that Christ not only came to represent all people before God, in his life, but also in his death. And that when Christ dies, he dies on behalf of all humanity. There are various well-known scriptures that do that, and, and I, I'm aware that some Christian traditions would deny it, uh, but it seems to be clearly the teaching of scripture, and it is the teaching of the majority of Christians. So already we have, th there is a deep orthodox instinct that God has purposes. It's not God takes no delight in the death of anyone. God's purpose, God wants, God's heart is for the salvation of all. And it's precisely for that purpose that he sends Christ to stand before God on behalf of all, to die on behalf of all, and not simply to die, but to be raised on behalf of all. And so the question is, in one sense, you know, I want to say you know, salvation for the, whole, for the whole humanity and for the whole creation is not something that in scripture we even hope God might do. But it is something that in the very person of Christ himself, God has already achieved. So in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, that is already done in the past, the salvation of all humanity and all creation, following from that, in our, in our place, in our representative, in our Messiah. And what the Holy Spirit is doing is working in creation by uniting people to Christ through faith and baptism, joining our lives to Christ so that we can participate in the salvation that's already achieved uh, in Christ, in the Messiah. And so my conviction is that what God intends to do and what God achieves in Christ through the work of the Holy Spirit, God will do by eventually bringing all people to faith in Christ and with them being united to him. So I'm not wanting to suggest and often people say this, oh my goodness, you think everyone will be saved. Does that mean all roads lead to God? Or does that mean it doesn't matter what we do because we're going to be saved anyway? Or we can go and sin because, uh, you know, or let's go and all those things we wanted to do that are really bad. We can do them because it doesn't matter because we're going to go to heaven anyway. So what, does it, what difference does it make? I'm not saying any of that. Because I don't think all roads lead to God. Um, I, do, I think the only way to God is through Christ. The only way to salvation is through union with Christ by the Holy Spirit. There isn't another. There isn't another option. So I'm not suggesting 
uh, something that's not Christ-centered or gospel-focused or about the cross and resurrection. I'm really wanting to say that in some senses Calvinists are right and in some senses Arminians are right in, my, in the way I try and hold things together. Because Calvinists have this very strong sense that God is sovereign. God will not fail in achieving his purposes. What God sets out to do, in the end, God will achieve it and God wins. I want to say that's right. That's absolutely right. And God intends to save humanity. And that's precisely what he's going to do. The, the, the Arminian, on the other hand, says, we believe God loves everyone. We believe God wants to save everyone. Of course, because of creatures' free will, uh, God won't, sadly won't be able to achieve his purposes, but that's what he wants to do, and that's what he tries to do through Christ. And the Calvinist, of course, says, well, no, if God wanted to do that, he could. If God wanted to save everyone, he could. If God wanted Jesus to die for everyone, he'd have done that. But that's, that's not what happened. I want to say, the Arminian's right. God loves everyone. God wants to save everyone. Christ died for everyone. The Calvinist is right in saying God will get his purposes done. God will achieve his purposes. And um, Christians have always been forced into this, um, you know, because we feel, we, because we feel that the, some people have to end up in hell forever. That's been our unshakable conviction. If that's where you start with, you're going to have to sacrifice something else. You're going to either have to say, as many Christians do, well, God could save them, but he didn't want to. Or you're going to have to say, well, he does want to, but he can't because somehow they throw a spanner in the works or, you know. The problem there is we, in Romans 5, you have this wonderful text, you know, as in Adam all die. So this is 1 Corinthians 15, as in Adam all die, so in Christ all be made alive. But in Romans 5, Paul has a similar thing, comparing Adam and Christ. And he's basically saying everything that goes wrong in Adam gets put right in Christ. And where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And there's nothing that sin can do to deface God's creation that grace in Christ cannot put right. And so there's no depths that sin can go to or human depravity can go to that the grace of God in Christ in the death and burial of Christ can't go deeper. And there's no sin that God can't deal with in Christ. And the end of the story is resurrection. It's empty tomb. It's not Golgotha. You know, it's the triumph of grace. And my worry with some theologies is it sounds like people are saying, um, where sin abounds, grace abounds a little bit. You know, where sin abounds, what sin does, grace undoes some of it. Whereas Paul is much more robust than this. It's where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. There's nothing that goes wrong in Adam that isn't restored in Christ and more and more. And so we get this. It's not just about, you know, finding proof texts, as so often the discussion degenerates, and look how many texts I've got. You know, I've got all these hell texts, so I've got all these universalist texts. Um, I think what we need is a way of telling the whole biblical story from creation through the new creation in a way that tries to do justice to the whole, and I want to do justice to the texts about hell. Um, and I could say something about that in a minute. There's justice to the whole story that tells the story in a way where the ending of the story makes sense where the ending of the story actually gets you where God wants to go and where God's already got in Christ. So I think the universalist end to the story makes sense of this. And we see this in Colossians 1 in the lovely Christ hymn where it says, by him, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by him all things were created. And in case we're wondering what all things are, he says all things in heaven and on earth and visible and invisible, it just kind of covers the ground, everything. Yeah, why else go that far to say it that way? Exactly. I mean, he's a everything, everything was created by him, for him, through him. And then later on, around verse 20, he says, and through him, God's reconciled all things to himself, making peace through the blood shed on the cross. And you think, well, what are the all things? Making, you know, reconciled all things. Well, we know what the all things are because he's just told us all things means everything, everything. He's just, and he said, everything in heaven, on earth, visible, invisible, everything, made through Christ, reconciled in Christ, making peace through the bloodshed on the cross. Now that doesn't, I mean, that to me sounds, that's about as universalist as you can get. 
And it's Christocentric, it's gospel focused, it's cross focused, it's about the work of God already achieved in Christ. But that doesn't mean that there's no need for a response. And, and, and so he, he says, you know, you too, you were reconciled when you first came to, you know, so they're participating in this. And we see it in 2 Corinthians 5 where Paul says, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And he's given us the message of reconciliation. So be reconciled to God. So there's this imperative. You know, God's done this in Christ. He's reconciled the world to himself. And we've got a message now. We proclaim what God has done in Christ. And there is a, there's a call that people need to participate in that, to be reconciled, not through doing something themselves, but through coming to throw themselves on the mercy of God, to trust in the, to put their trust in the grace of God, and, uh, and through the Spirit be united to join their lives with Christ in faith and in baptism. Um, so, you know, it's, it, it, in Colossians, we have this thing that runs from creation through the cross to new creation. And it's a way of telling this biblical story that where the story ends in the way you think, that's right, that's the way it should end. Whereas if you say the story actually ends where some people are being suffering forever and ever, um, and there's no possibility of redemption for them, you think, well, how is that? For, you know, for me, as I ask this question, I'm not suggesting... This is what all Christians think, because it's not what most Christians think. How is that an ending that makes sense to this story? It just seems out of place. You know, is it, has God somehow, God's love somehow deficient, or is his power somehow deficient, or is the cross somehow deficient? Or, you know, what's, what's gone wrong? How's it gone wrong to end up like this? Um, so I, 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 I want to find a way then to say, well, how can we do justice to the stuff, what the Bible says about hell within that kind of framework? Because the Bible speaks very clearly about it, and Jesus speaks very clearly about it. And if we're going to be those who, rather than say, well, this is what I'd like to think God was like, and invent God in our own image, we have to respond to revelation. You know? And so we have to find, we have to say, these texts are important, and we need to do justice to them within our theology. But what I want to do is to say, well, why assume that Hell is a place from which there is no redemption. Why is that the sort of unwritten law that if you go to hell, that's it? There's no exit. Even if you repent, even if you throw yourself on the mercy of God, even if you put your faith in Christ, that's it. Tough. You know, there's no. And I think there are biblical grounds for seeing that it is that yes, there is an eschatological judgment, and yes, it is something that that some people will experience, but it is not a point of no return. I think this comes out nicely in the book of Revelation, where you have this, the two most ferocious hell texts in the whole Bible. In chapter 14, we have the smoke of their torment ascending forever and ever. And in chapter um, 20, 21, you've got the lake of fire and sulfur. And, and it just, it, it's a, it's where all the, medi you know, the medieval images of what people imagine hell is like comes from this, this very graphic um, imagery, which is drawing on Old Testament um, Im imagery. But what's amazing about this is that both of these texts, when you read them in context, are chronologically followed by a picture of the redemption of the very nations who have just been said that the smoke of their torment rises or that they're or that they're in the lake of fire. We, we read in the next section, so in chapter 15, we have this, like an epilogue, where the redeemed are standing around the lake of fire, and they talk about all the nations. And we know in Revelation, the nations are always the baddies, okay? The church are never called the nations. The church are those who are called out from the nations, and they're always distinguished from the nations. But here, all the nations will come and worship you. It says, but hold on a minute, they've just been chucked in the lake of fire. It's even clearer in chapter 21, where we see the kings of the earth also always baddies in Revelation. Kings of the earth thrown into the lake of fire, the nations are slain by the Messiah, Jesus he comes back by the sword from his mouth and destroyed. That's it, you know, they, they, they've, they've had it. There's judgment. But then in, we read in chapter 21, they see this image of the new Jerusalem and the gates are always open and the kings of the earth and the nations are bringing their treasures in. And you're thinking, hold on a minute, what? They're, they're, they're the guys that have just been there in the lake of fire. What are they doing here? You know, but the, the doors are open. And, you know, I argue in a book I wrote that they're actually coming, you know, being redeemed and washed in the blood of the Lamb 
and coming out of that into redemption. After death, a sort of post-mortem union with Christ. Um, and so in the end, God will be all in all, uh, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, that's the sort of destiny I envisage and which sort of inspires me with hope when I see a lot of the really terrible things that happen in the world, I think. But in Christ, God has redeemed. And in the end, God will, will bring about, you know, for the whole creation, what he's already done for creation in Christ. What, what about the passage in, in uh, Acts chapter... Two, I think it is, that speaks where, in Peter's sermon, he's talking about the, uh, uh, the times of refreshing, times of restitution of all things. Um, because a lot of times people will raise the, the issue of, well, does God love Adolf Hitler? Does God love, uh, you know, Mussolini? And they can't comprehend that somebody who was that destructive of... Uh, of other people could possibly be saved, and so the person himself is cited. But it would seem that that when uh, once everything is restored, everything that Hitler may have taken away from anyone is 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 resolved, restored. Um, it, in the way that it would be in the age to come as opposed to, you know, maybe just uh, I mean, the life is back, the, that the ability of the, of the people who were um, destroyed by someone like Adolf Hitler, and it could be anybody, I mean, you have, you have people who just go wild and go and kill a family, or their ability to forgive uh, would, would be resolved as well I mean, when, when we're mm -hmm. redeemed and, and made immortal and we're walk, enter the fullness of the kingdom, our ability to forgive would be uh, not a question anymore. Yes, and of course, you know, people often raise the Hitler thing and because Hitler's um, crimes are so terrible, you know, they sort of become emblematic of how could... But, you know, salvation never trivializes sin. I mean, this is, in the cross, God doesn't... God saves us through the cross, and in the cross, sin is not trivialized or passed over or ignored. We see the horror of sin for what it is exposed, and that is our sins as well as Hitler's. But, you know, if, if we're Christians and we understand something of the grace of God, I sometimes... One day when people raise the Hitler thing, if Christians raise the Hitler thing, I think, but I mean, what, do you think you deserve to be saved? You, know, you, you, you somehow deserve, Hitler doesn't deserve to be saved. It'd be wrong for, but you're okay. You know, it's all right for God to save you. That doesn't require too much grace because I wasn't really that bad. Um, and I think it betrays a, a failure to understand God's grace, God's love, but also the transforming power of Christ and the Spirit. You know, when, when we talk about, when, so I do think God loved Hitler because Hitler was a human being made in the image of God and terribly broken and warped and evil, but not so broken that they can't, can't be restored in Christ, not so evil that God can't change them by the Holy Spirit. You know, no... Nobody, no sin is that deep or that big that it can't be restored in Christ. And no person is that broken that they can't be restored in Christ. And the same grace of God that saved you or me is the same grace of God that can save someone like that. And, of course, enable a reconciliation uh, to take place. You know, and, and Hitler would have to experience remorse and regret and repentance and on, on, on all of that, but, but I, don't, I, I just don't see how it could be a Christian instinct that it would, that it would be somehow appropriate for God to save me, but not Hitler. Uh, two things come into play. There, there's a, uh, some people feel a sense that, that whatever someone has done, they need to be punished at least enough to experience what they perpetrated on somebody else. Um, and, and that's their sense of fairness. 
um, others feel that um, well, it, it's all this feeling. It's a sense of, of needing uh, of vengeance and so on, or needing some, a sense of justice or whatever. Um, it's, it, it has always struck me that, that we don't appreciate the fact that, at least what I think is a fact, that we all have it in us to be exactly like Hitler, given the, the opportunity. To, given the circumstances, given the power, the authority that to uh, wreak, you know, some sort of vengeance or justice or uh, on people that we don't like, that we feel are in our way, we feel that are a drag on society or whatever, uh, and everybody has their different views of who that might be, and. I think within our hearts we, we feel that from time to time. If we're going to be honest with ourselves, we, we, and if we had the opportunity and, and, uh, and, and a council around us that said that's the right thing to do, that's what we need to do to further uh, society or whatever, uh, we all have it in us to mm -hmm. uh, react mm -hmm. that way. Mm -hmm. We, in fact, do react that way mm -hmm. sometimes uh, for a moment with our own families, with people we care about. We can. Uh, have a moment of uh, of anger that reflects what's in our heart. Uh, we all need a redemption from all that kind of thing. Yeah. To to single out an individual like who who has uh, who is notorious, and then say I could never be like that. I think is naive and, and silly on our parts. Mm -hmm. It's one of the things that was so scary about those psychological experiments where you uh, with the electric shocks. Um, where it was, it was set up where somebody pretended to be um, in a chair receiving electric shocks, where in fact they were an actor, they weren't at all. And uh, the psychologist would invite someone to control the levels of electricity. And whenever the person in the chair got an answer to a question wrong, the, par the participant had to in administer an electric shock to them. And each time they got it wrong, they turned the shock up. In fact, there was no electricity at all, but they didn't know that. And what they found is, if the scientist told the person, it's okay, you know, they, they might be screaming and making a lot of noise, but they'll be fine, just keep doing it. The number of people who actually were willing to administer lethal electric shocks uh, was very disturbing. And this was um, research done on the back of, well, why, why was it that apparently decent, good German guards would be prepared to participate in the Holocaust just because they were told to by people they trusted? And it's quite scary to realize some of the things that we might be prepared to do in certain circumstances. We've never faced the circumstances, so how do we know how we would right. respond? And, uh, but the point is that, that we need redemption as much as the next person. And um, it's no surprise that, that uh, uh, Christ came for all of us. We, we all need the redemption. We're all capable of it. And sin is sin. It's, it's, uh, I've never seen that as a, as a good argument, even though, of course, you can understand it, especially if you're a victim of, of someone. Yeah, sure, sure. And there are, I mean, there are um, arguments against the view that I take, um, and I, you know, I sympathize with them, some of them. It's, it's not the mainstream historic tradition, and the most spiritual Christians in our history haven't, you know, most of them have believed in traditional views of hell, and the best theologians in our tradition, most of those, have believed in traditional views of hell, and I acknowledge that. You know, I don't, I wouldn't for a minute suggest that if you believe in a traditional understanding of hell, you're callous or you're, you're corrupt or, or anything of the sort. I just think it's a traditional, the traditional understanding of hell is one that, that ends up forcing us to reject or it creates tensions within a, a traditional Christian theology of the doctrine of God that is problematic. I mean, oftentimes people will go, yeah, but you see, Robin, what you need to understand is God's loving, but he's also just, you see. And then they give with that knowing look, as if somehow I'm wanting to say God's loving, but he's not just. You know, <laughs> he's loving, but he doesn't right. punish people. Right. Or, is, you know, that's, that's so wrong-headed to me because I think you, you can't, God hasn't got two sides, you know. Sometimes I do loving things and sometimes I do just things. Yes. Everything that God does is, is motivated by the holy love of God. Everything that God does is just. Everything that God does is loving. If God could do things that were just but not loving, 
as is being implied, hell is God being just, but it's not God being loving. I think, well, hold on. You know, if, if everything God does is motivated by the holy love of this God, who is an integrated God, it's not, he's not schizophrenic. Or something, you, you need to give an account of hell where you can say this is something that would be done, that would be done by a holy, loving God. A holy and loving. And this, this action of sending someone to hell is an action that is consistent, not just with God's justice, but also with God's love. You know, and, if, and it's not that I have some sentimental view of love. You know, I, I, I think I have a, I seek to have a biblical view of love, a kind of understanding of love that's based around how God has revealed his love to us in Christ. I mean, and what the cross is about and, and this, this whole story, it's stretching the notion and shaping the notion of what God's love is like around creation and redemption. You know, but I think, I wonder if, you know, how can you say, how can it be the case that God is love if some of the things he does are just but not loving? You know, it has to be loving. And if it's, and if it's eternal torment with absolutely no hope of redemption, how is that loving? It becomes a problem. How is that an act of God, the holy, loving God? I guess it depends on one's definition of love. I, I attended a, a, a lecture by a, a noted American theologian, and it was on this topic of uh, God's justice. And uh, someone asked the question, well, if, how, can, how can I enjoy heaven if I'm looking at my loved ones writhing in, in, in hell? And he said, well, if you understood God's, the God's holy love, you would know that, that God's love is, um, is consistent with, with that. He enjoys the destruction of his enemies, and you will enjoy it as well. Uh, that is how God's love uh, is, and, and you will experience God's love that way too. Yeah. Well, that's a very dehumanizing theology. I mean, well, what, what kind of human being does that shape you to be? God has created us with a sense of love that wars against such utter nonsense. Exactly. So, I mean, it's a repulsive notion, I think. I can understand the sort of... <laughs> it comes out of a desire to submit to revelation, and I can respect that. Yeah, a, a desire to uphold the sovereignty of God. Yeah, but you end up where you, you, you have a theology which is shaping humans where what it is to be fully human and fully redeemed is that we would be able to look at people suffering in excruciating pain and rejoice in it. It, it takes, it takes a, 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 some kind of a, of, of a logical definition of how God must be, and then it, then it takes, uh, by logic, in order to safeguard the sovereignty, and then it discards all sense of of love that's actually mm. found mm. in Scripture mm. and, and turns it on its head to fit that. Yes. that but, well, there was, he, in fact, he went on to say that, look, you have to understand that, that God is an infinite God and that he, uh, that a sin against God, therefore, is an infinite sin. Mm -hmm. And an infinite sin requires an infinite punishment. And it's, mm -hmm. only, it's only fair and just. And I thought that is a, a third grader would not reason with such nonsense. How can a human being who is not infinite, how can, how can a sin from a human being be infinite? Nothing about a human being is infinite. Whether, uh, so you're going to say a, a human sin is infinite? How, how, that doesn't yeah. even make sense. You're grossly overestimating human <laughs> capacities there. I, yeah, I mean, I, and I've argued at some length against that argument uh, in my book, uh, The Evangel Evangelical Universalist. I, I think that's right. I mean, you know, I, if God is shaping us to be more loving, more sensitive to the pain of others, then you would think that the culmination of, you know, of, of redemption, when we're redeemed, fully redeemed and so on, we would see the suffering of others and, ex and experience it with sorrow. And this is precisely how you see God responding to the suffering, even the suffering that God himself inflicts. So in the book of Jeremiah, for instance, God himself punishes Israel for their sin, and yet at several times we see God lamenting over the suffering of the people. He's not going, you don't see God going, well, this is deserved and it's just, 
And so I rejoice in it because uh, you know, God, yes, it might be deserved and yes, it might be just, but God's not rejoicing in it. God does, takes no delight in the death of the wicked, as Ezekiel says. And so you have this, it paints a vision of God where God's somehow rejoicing in this and we should be rejoicing in this. You know, we'll be standing there looking at uh, maybe our children who've turned away exactly. from the Lord, suffering, and we will praise God. Yes, this is glorious that you would and it just something inside of most people is repelled by that yes and i don't think that's because we've got sinful minds i mean i think that's a deep christian instinct based on a christian understanding of what love is and what it is to be a human and, and what it is for god to be god and for god to be loving it's not just sentimentalism jose 11 my heart recoils within me how can i give you up yeah in the face of of the of the punishment god can't even endure it, <laughs> watching yeah. it, so he reverses it. Yeah. And he, tell, he calls on us to, uh, doesn't he? I mean, he says to us, love your enemies, do good to those who persecute you. And yet, what is this something he does not, will not, cannot do? It's, it just makes no sense. Which is, which is, I guess, a problem, you know, that is God calling? This was an argument that uh, an 18th century Baptist preacher called Elhanan Winchester a uh, revivalist guy during the uh, latter part of the 18th century, who also happened to be a universalist. So he was quite unusual. And he employed this argument. He says, you know, are we saying that God is calling us to do things that he himself doesn't do? You know, that yeah. he's calling us to love our enemies, but he doesn't do that. You know, he's calling us to pray for the lost with hope for their salvation, but he doesn't because he knows they're not going to be saved. So he's got no hope for their salvation. <laughs> Uh, you know, is God requiring us to do things that he doesn't do? Uh, it's, it's just, it's just, it's problematic. You know? it's, and there's all sorts of problems with that. Uh, I've yet to see, I mean, the one actually got me into this was reflecting, I read William Lane Craig's book, Only Wise God. William Craig is a brilliant uh, philo evangelical philosopher. And um, I was, he was talking about ha a way in which it's possible it might be possible, it's controversial, as to how God could be sovereign and humans could have free will, understood in the sort of libertarian sense of being able to do something or not do it. And I thought, wow, that's amazing, you know, but so God could allow us freedom and get his will done. Brilliant. And then I almost immediately, this was years ago, I thought, but then why does anyone end up in hell forever? Because if God could get his will done as well as allowing us our freedom, how does that work? And so he has some attempt to argue how it is that God could allow some people to be in hell. And I was, to my horror, because I really wanted to believe in traditional view of hell, it didn't work. I, I just thought, I am not at all persuaded by this. And that really uh, unnerved me, because at the time I thought, but I know that the Bible says that some people will be in hell forever. I thought that was a given and not open for question. Um, and that then started me on a search, you know, have I got the, have I understood the Bible right, you know, or haven't I? And uh, yeah, so I, you know, I began searching for a few years, thinking, trying to think it through, and, and I came to conclusions which would differ, differ from most Christians, but, but in a sense, I want to say, look, what I, what I believe is, is orthodox, it's consistent with everything in the creeds, uh, it, it comes out of the evangel, it's gospel focused, it grows out of reflections on the cross, it's Christ-centered, it's Trinitarian, you know, it affirms the inspiration of scripture and it tries to do justice to a whole load of texts, including hell texts. Um, it is not, in terms of orthodox Christ Christianity, heretical, although it might be fringe. Uh, so I, I just want to argue this is, is a view that should be tolerated as an orth an ex a possible expression of orthodox Christianity. And I, I would just add as well that, that uh, even if there are those who, who, who do hold out and, and, and never do respond to God's love. God's love is no less what it is for them. And the scripture makes absolutely plain what God's heart is and his desire is, even if he does allow someone to hold out, which I, I have to struggle with, even though I have to allow it, I, I, I guess, but because I don't know. Uh, but I do know God's heart uh, because he reveals it. And I know that he's awfully good at what he does. Yeah. <laughs>
You've been watching You're Included, a production of Grace Communion International.